The 39 books of the Old Testament were God's total written revelation during that time. God was preparing his world for the coming of his son, the Messiah, the central promise of the Old Testament. Then it happened. Jesus actually came to live and die for the sins of the world. After that, God inspired new writers to complete the Bible by telling the New Testament story of Jesus and what his coming means for all of us. This week on Connecting the Gap, we're going to continue our study on prophecies of the Bible as we start off the New Testament. We'll get into Matthew right after this. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Connecting the Gap. I'm Daniel Moore, your host of this podcast. You are listening to a brand new episode of our podcast for this week. It's a study based on a study by Damon Duck, Prophecies of the Bible. Hope you guys have enjoyed this study so far. We've been doing this for quite some time, but we've now reached the New Testament as we cruise on towards Revelation. We'll get there eventually, I promise. Hope you guys have really enjoyed uh, the prophecy so far as we started in Genesis and and have worked our way to here. Uh, You may have not even realized a lot of the the prophetic content that was in the Old Testament, uh, which kind of set the stage for the New Testament um, prophecies as well. They all work together, and they're all truth. A lot of these things have already happened, and some of them are are coming up here in the future. And uh, so I've really enjoyed doing this study and sharing it with you, and hopefully you have as well. You can go to my website, connectingthegap.net. All of my podcast episodes are there. You can also get my YouTube channel link and my Rumble link uh, as I'm on Rumble now as well. I'm also on Facebook and uh, my personal Twitter, so you can check out uh, my Facebook page also for the links for some of these podcasts. But please subscribe and share to people that might need to know Jesus and understand more about that God's Word is all about and where we are headed here on this earth in the future in the end times as we are living right now during that time. So as we get started this week, as I said, we're going to be kicking off the New Testament. I'm going to set a little bit of uh, some groundwork here before we actually get into Matthew. And uh, and so we'll start here with uh, some some preface as we get into the New Testament this week on Connecting the Gap. After God gave the prophecies found in the Old Testament books, most scholars believe he went silent for about 400 years. This period of silence is often referred to as the intertestamental period. That's the 400-year period between the Old and New Testaments. During this time, the Old Testament books were collected, copied, and validated, or officially confirmed and found to be accurate or true, by Jewish authorities as meeting the standard of divine inspiration. They were assembled into a single collection, accepted as the Word of God, and kept in a safe place. Shortly after the Old Testament was written, the Greeks took over the world and their language became the common language on the earth. Tradition says a man called Ptolemy Philadelphus, assembled 70 scholars who were experts in both Hebrew and Greek and commissioned them to translate the Old Testament writings into the Greek language. This translation, which is called the Septuagint, or a Greek translation of the Bible written in the 3rd century BC, means 70, was in use when God began to speak again and the New Testament came into being. Jesus often quoted from the books found in the Old Testament, but he never quoted from the Apocrypha. The same can be said of the New Testament writers. They quoted from the Old Testament over and over again, but there is only one questionable instance of the Apocrypha being quoted. This seems to be the evidence that Jesus and the New Testament writers accepted the authority of the Old Testament writings, but not the authority of the Apocrypha. Some will argue that several prominent early church leaders, including Arrhenius and Tertullian, accepted the Apocrypha as Scripture. That's true, but others can compile a long list of prominent early church leaders, including Jerome and Oregon, who rejected it. Some will argue that the Roman Catholic Church includes the Apocrypha in their Bible, so Protestants should include it in theirs. The Roman Catholic Church does include it, but did not for about 1,500 years which is right, the early Roman Catholic Church or the modern Roman Catholic Church. 
Some will argue that the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox churches include the Apocrypha in their Bible. That's true, but they disagree with each other and with the Roman Catholic Church over which books to include, so they each have a different Apocrypha. Finally, some will argue that a few good seminaries teach the Apocrypha. That's true also, but they don't teach it as God-inspired scripture. They teach it because it contains valuable information about the Jewish nation, its history and customs, which is helpful in understanding the 66 books that are recognized as scripture. These seminaries deny salvation by works, which is taught in the book of Tobit, and prayers for the dead, which is taught in the book of 2 Maccabees. They also denounce adding or taking away from the Bible, which agrees with what is taught in the book of Revelation. If they are aware of it, they will probably admit that many of Muhammad's ideas came from the Apocrypha, and that at least some of them have been a disaster for the world, and especially for the Islamic people. The rationale for suicide bombers and jihad is rooted in salvation by works. So as we begin into the prophecies of the Gospels and Acts, the first segment in the New Testament is a group of four books called the Gospels. The word gospel, or good news, comes from the Greek language and it means good news or glad tidings. These books present the good news about Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and second coming. They also contain several prophecies of which many were given by Jesus, and some are recorded more than once by the different gospel writers. The second segment in the New Testament is a single single book commonly called Acts. Some refer to Acts as the fifth gospel because it picks up where the four gospels leave off and takes us to the next book, one of the many letters written by the Apostle Paul. Without this transition, we wouldn't understand many things about the early church, including its beginnings, doctrines, power, and phenomenal growth. The Gospels teach many important truths about man and his relationship with God. Some of the most important truths include that man is a sinner. Jesus' death is payment for man's sin. Apart from Jesus, the human race is fallen and without hope. Jesus' death offers hope to the whole world. God wants us to live our lives according to his will. Prophecies reveal that history is moving toward the end of age to a time when Jesus will sit on a throne and rule over a kingdom here on earth. The first five truths are very important, especially if one wants to know who God is and how to have a personal relationship with him. But for the study that we are in here with this Prophecies of the Bible study, we are chiefly concerned with the sixth truth. Henry Haley was quoted, the four gospels by all odds, the most important part of the Bible, more important than all the rest of the Bible put together, more important than all the rest of the Bibles in the whole world put together. For we could better afford to be without the knowledge of everything else than to be without the knowledge of Christ. We're going to go ahead and get started now in the book of Matthew as we start the New Testament this week. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through 12, We have the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here we hear about the prophecy on the mount. This section of scripture is part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a famous sermon preached by Jesus on a high hill near Capernaum. It is commonly called the Beatitudes, or a declaration of blessedness in the Sermon on the Mount, and it is one of the most popular passages in the Bible. It contains high ethical or moral standards and is a a favorite of many preachers. Some who never deliver a prophetic sermon preach from these verses over and over again. But these Beatitudes are more than an amazing set of principles to live by. They also have a prophetic nature. The poor in spirit are people who know they are sinners and are convinced they have no way to pay for the sins they have committed. Because they are unable to settle their own sin debt, they humble themselves and seek a Savior to pay in their place. Those who do this are made members of the kingdom of heaven. 
Their membership becomes effective as soon as they sincerely profess their faith in Jesus, but they will not realize the full benefits of it until the millennium begins. The meek are the people who profess faith and have received the nature of Jesus. They are gentle people who practice self-control and tolerance, which is a fruit of the Spirit. They are God's children and as much will possess the earth when millennium arrives. Those who are persecuted because of righteousness or justice, peace, and right doing are the ones who try to live right and seek to spread right living around the world. They have accepted Christ as their Savior or God's children and want others to be God's children too. Because of this, they are ridiculed, shunned, and in some cases physically harmed. God has made them members of the kingdom of heaven. John Walvoord said, A careful reading of the Sermon on the Mount supports the conclusion that what Christ was dealing with were the ethical principles of the kingdom which will come into play in the future millennium kingdom, but to some extent are applicable today. Accordingly, in the Sermon on the Mount, there are frequent references to the present and how the principles he is enunciating should be applied. At the same time, there is a distant view of the realization of these ethical principles when Christ will be reigning on earth. Being a Christian in this life will cost a person. Those who try to do the will of God will be insulted, persecuted, and falsely accused. But God will give them a great reward in heaven. These are ethical principles that spell out the way God wants us to live now, but they will have a greater application in the millennium and beyond. Those who try to live by them now will receive great rewards in the future. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, it talks about from the first coming to the second coming. Another parable that he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew 13 is a well-known chapter in the Bible because it contains a series of parables or stories about familiar things that teach or illustrate unfamiliar things about the kingdom of heaven. These parables give insight into the course of events in the kingdom of heaven between the first and second comings of Jesus. One of them is called the parable of the weeds. The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a man, or the son of man, or Jesus, who sowed good seed. Sons of the kingdom, or the children of God, or the saved people in this field, or the world. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy the devil came and sowed weeds. Sons of the evil one, or the children of the devil, which are the lost, among the wheat, which is the children of God, and went away. When the wheat, who are the children of God, sprouted and formed heads, when they began to grow and produce, then the weeds, or the children of the devil, also appeared. When that happened, servants of the owner, who was Jesus, asked if they should remove the weeds, or the children of the devil, from the field or the world. The owner said no. To do so might harm some of the wheat, which are the children of God. He said to let them grow together until the harvest, which is the end of the age. Then he will send harvesters, or angels, and they will collect the weeds, the children of the devil, tie them in bundles, and they will be burned in the fiery furnace." Jesus is revealing the fact that there are two sowings going on in the kingdom of heaven. One is of God, and the other is of the devil. The children of God and the children of the devil are growing alongside each other in the world. Some would like to have the children of the devil removed, but God does not want that to happen until the end of the age. When the time arrives, God's angels will remove them. They will be restrained until the judgment, and then burned. Thomas Ice and Timothy Demi are quoted saying, Actually, since Matthew 13 surveys this present age in relation to the kingdom, the parables cover the period of time between Christ's two advents, his first and second comings. This includes the tribulation, second coming, and final judgment after the rapture.
The Life Application Bible Commentary states it like this, The weeds may be people in the church who appear to be believers, but who never truly believe. The apostles later battled the problem of false teachers who came from within the ranks of the believers. God will not eliminate all opposition until the end of the age. Comparisons have been drawn between the seven parables of Matthew 13 and the seven letters of Revelation 2 and 3. Jesus spoke the parables and Jesus dictated the letters. Both are about the church age. The parable of the sower has the church age beginning with the sowing of the word. But some members are not producing fruit or are declining in fruit bearing because of Satan's interference. The letter to the church at Ephesus compares by showing the church age getting off to a good start. But some members are declining by leaving their first love. The parable of the wheat and tares has Jesus sowing the word. But Satan is following with false sowing. The letter to the church of Smyrna compares by showing people entering the church who are from the synagogue of Satan. The parable of the mustard seed shows unusual expansion of the church during the church age because Satan nests in its branches. The letter to the church of Pergamos compares somewhat by revealing that false teachers will enter into the church. Skipping forward, the last parable, the parable of the dragnet, shows Jesus coming back at the end of the church age with his angels to separate the good fish from the bad fish and to cast the bad fish away. The letter to the church of Laodicea compares by having Jesus spew out lukewarm members. The entire picture is a prophecy about the church going through phases or stages, with the overall result being the church growing numerically while declining spiritually. Corruption in the church will be a major problem for true believers at the end of the age. Jesus is patient and loving, but he will ultimately and severely deal with it. Many people make the mistake of thinking this harvest is is the rapture, but the rapture removes the church from the earth and takes it to heaven. This harvest removes the children of the devil from the earth and binds them for burning. The rapture occurs before the tribulation period. This harvest occurs after the tribulation period. The wheat and the weed represents people in the kingdom of heaven. The wheat represents saved Gentiles and Jews. The weeds represent lost Gentiles and Jews, but many of them will claim to be saved. Christians are sowing the gospel today, but after the rapture, the 144,000 Jews, the two witnesses, and an angel will sow the gospel for God. And the Antichrist and false prophet will sow for the devil. The harvest is the second coming. So that's going to conclude this week on Connecting the Gap. And wow. That parable was a little bit to get through there. I hope you guys followed me on that. You may have to go back and listen to that again uh, as I was trying to give you the... Uh, the, the comparison there of the parts of the parable and, and what they meant as we went through each section. But hopefully uh, we got the explanation there pretty good on that. And it really kind of hit home with me here as we at this last you know section here that we just discussed, how the church is growing numerically while declining spiritually. And isn't that the truth? You can look around and there are so many churches out there today that have grown to dramatic numbers, but they are just a feel-good biblical teaching and it's it's actually not biblical it's an unbiblical teaching they aren't teaching the truth they aren't teaching the word they're teaching prosperity and wealth good feelings and and all of the things that goes along with that trying to keep friends and not make enemies and that is the type of people that jesus is going to spew out of his mouth when the end times come a lot of people think they're going to make it but they're not going to. And I pray that anybody listening to this podcast, I pray that you've searched your heart out, searched your soul, and allow God to change you from the inside out so that you will not be part of that number that will not make it to eternity to live with Jesus forever. I hope to be there. I hope to see you there in that, in that, at that time when that time comes. We're going to finish up this week, and we'll be back next week and get on into Matthew a little bit further as we continue our study on prophecies of the Bible. And uh, don't forget to visit my website, ConnectingTheGap.net, and you can subscribe there to my podcast, my blog, my YouTube channel, and Rumble. Well, I'm out of here. Until next week, don't forget that God's Word never fails us. God's Word has stood the test of time, and through Jesus' death on the cross, He has connected the gap.